All right, uh, quick review. The title, probably something that was added later, not by Luke. Um, Acts of the Apostles. I think by the third century or maybe the fourth century, we actually had the title Acts of the Apostles. Uh, I don't recall for certain. The purpose of it, we determined a uh, peacemaker between Pauline and Petrine uh, forces is probably a bad idea. There was no division between those two groups. There was no two groups. There was only one church. And they agreed on their doctrine. A brief for Paul's trial in Rome? Possibly. But the most likely reason was that this is uh, trying to create a history of the church and teach people how to become Christians. The authorship, Luke. External evidences, people attributing the book to Luke who were writing or living back in the second, third, and fourth centuries, and the fifth century. And then the internal evidence, there's no signature, but we can tell from what Paul writes that um, Luke is a close associate of his. And we can tell from the we statements in the book of Acts that whoever wrote it was a close associate of Paul's and actually traveled with him. Trustworthiness, there's been attacks on it. We countered those attacks pretty well. Uh, Assurances of trustworthiness, the dates are in there. There's some fixed dates that we have. Author connects events and acts with world his historical events. He mentions the passage of days, more so in the second half of the book, but that's because he was there. He is accurate in so many different things, so many different ways. He never makes a mistake noting the different moral rules, political conditions, activities when discussing the different cultures in Asia. When he talks about political figures, he calls them by their proper names. He was incredibly accurate about the shipwreck that uh, Paul suffered or went through and how they handled that, tossing the cargo over the side dropping the anchor, trying to slow their, their motion through the water. Everything was just, it's incredibly accurate. Luke's orderly manner of presentation is excellent. And he inserts the different speeches made by Peter and Paul and other disciples quite nicely, perfectly actually. Luke writes from the general to the particular he may comment about a certain individual before he actually uses them uh, or focuses on them later on. For instance, Barnabas. We get a hint at Barnabas in the end of Acts chapter 4, and then he connects Barnabas again with Paul when they start making missionary journeys together. Even before that, Barnabas is, is preaching and he calls for Paul to help him. Uh, he does the same thing with, with Paul. Makes mention of Paul at the end of Acts chapter 7, part of the, or as one of the guys holding the cloaks of the people who were stoning Stephen. A chapter later, he is, well, a little bit more than a chapter later, he has uh, his experience meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus and becoming a Christian. And then a couple more chapters later, we have him working in ministry. And the focus changes at that point, chapter 13, from Peter and the other people to Paul and his activities through the rest of the book of Acts. Date. We determined Acts to be written roughly around 63. We did that in part based on the turnover between 
Festus and Felix as governor of, of in Caesarea. Um, they were governor over the area. The turnover of that took place in 60. Paul had been a prisoner there for two years at that point, 58. And just before the turnover, or as the turnover occurs, he's saying, I appeal to Caesar, at which time he was sent on his way to Caesar. It took a year, roughly a year of traveling. The end of the book of Acts tells us that he was two years in his own paid-for apartments under house arrest. So that leaves us with 63, doesn't it? Math, does, that, does the math match? Okay. Place of writing, Rome, everybody agrees. No arguments. The destination. Did we cover this two weeks ago? We haven't covered destination? Okay, we're in the right place then. That's where I thought we were at. The destination. Who's he writing to? What's the guy's name? Theophilus. Good. Theophilus. What's the name mean? Well, the word theos means God. Phyllis or Phyllis means brother or friend. Friend of God. Is Theophilus a person or a group of people, friends of God? I think the way it's written, it just seems to be an individual rather than a group of people. But you may have come up with a question sometime or another. It really, you can't determine with absolute certainty. But just the way it's written just seems to be an individual rather than a group of people. Now, who is Theophilus? Luke's Gospel says, or, or addresses him as most excellent. Where else have we seen that term used? Two other people are addressed that way, both in the book of Acts, both by Paul. He addresses both Felix and Festus as most excellent. So the term gives us the idea or the impression that Theophilus is a person of importance. Is he a political figure? We don't know. There are some Theophiluses in the book or in the uh, history. We'll cover those when we get to chapter 1. The church, according to uh, the other destination for the book, is the church. The people of the church according to God's providence. He wanted us to have it, so it's part of our Bibles. Why? Because we needed a history of how things started. You know, for the Restoration Movement, this is incredibly important to us. This is one of the more important books that got our, our movement started. The Restoration Movement is, the premise of it is to restore the ancient order of things, the way things were in the first century church, the way things were when the apostles established the church. And we find that in the book of Acts. There are some things that the letters teach us, but Acts, Acts is where we go to to establish our baseline. Integrity of the book of Acts. The definition of integrity is, well, essentially to preserve the entire text substantially as it was written initially. In other words, the translations that we have today, do they represent what Luke actually wrote 2,000 years ago? And the answer is yes. Scholars generally agree, the majority of scholars hold to the integrity of the book, but it is substantially the same as when, that it, it is substantially, excuse me, my tongue is getting twisted. 
it's substantially the same as when he wrote it. Um, there is a concern that very little is quoted among the early church fathers, the anti-Nicene fathers in particular. Why is that? Well, it is thought that they spent more time on other New Testament manuscripts because the book of Acts contains very little about Christ. Right? It's the church, it's how it started, how, it's got, how it got going. And that's not something that should cause us, give us reason to question the integrity of the book of Acts. In fact, it, really, I wish the early church fathers had spent more time in the book of Acts because then maybe they would have stayed on track. As we know, the church got way off track. And at some point, certain elements that are still in existence today are, have assumed authority over the Bible rather than the other way around. Is that right? Absolutely not. How do you change what inspired apostles wrote? Inspired men who were with the apostles. How do you change what they received from God to something you concluded on your own? It, it was a, a terrible thing to happen. Maybe had they focused on the book of Acts a little bit more, maybe they could have stayed on point. This isn't a history of the church. We are fortunate to have the fathers in the Restoration Movement. We're fortunate to have the fathers in the, the Protestant Movement that led to the Restoration Movement and the restoration of the ancient order of things, like the book of Acts and how we are supposed to do things. Characteristics. Uh, this is a great missionary journal. If you're going to become a missionary, you better be adept, uh, a, a scholar of the book of Acts. How, how do you begin a church? How do you start a church in a new culture? Read the book of Acts and see how they did it. That's where you're going to find it. The other epistles maybe may mostly focus on how our lives are to be led for Christ. Acts tells you how to become one with Christ. We have some other questions that Acts leaves us that other books answer. Uh, baptism, for instance, we find more information on baptism as we read the epistles. But baptism becomes important first in the book of Acts. Maybe we go back a little ways and say baptism becomes important when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing. Correct. Baptizing and teaching everything he commanded, including the command to baptize and teach everything he commanded. So there are only, what, 11 people in that meeting? Maybe more. I don't know. My professor said he thought it was the 500 on, the, on that uh, hilltop. We don't know that. The text tells us it was the 11. That's all it tells us. Maybe there were 500. But that's not important. What is important is Jesus said, go, make disciples, baptizing, teaching everything I have commanded you, including the command to go and baptize and teach. So here we are today, baptizing and teaching. Jim McGuigan, um, Church of Christ preacher, Irish, very fiery guy. It's a uh, watched his series on the book of Acts on YouTube. It's pretty good. Um, his, he told a story one time. He and his daughter were coming from a church where he had preached at, and he asked his daughter what, what she thought of his sermon. She looked at him. She says, it was quite violent. When I say fiery, he is fiery. 
I loved his book on Daniel, his commentary on Daniel. And he does not hold back on, on uh, his thoughts on premillennialism. Flush. The book of Acts in his, how he titles it or subtitles it or alternate titles it, the gospel of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit work in the world. How does it start? Okay, let's go a little bit beyond the beginning. Let's go to where the church starts. What does it start with? The Holy Spirit. Chapter 2, verse 1. The Holy Spirit. On to the twelve. And then the twelve go out and start preaching. That's how it starts. It is the Holy Spirit at work in the world. It's the Holy Spirit at work through men. Inspiring men to write the Gospels, the book of Acts, the epistles, the things that we need to know to become Christians and to be good Christians. It's the Holy Spirit at work. Okay. What is the value of, of these introductory studies? What can we take from them? Uh, anytime I teach a class, there's always introductory studies. And I usually like to spend one class period doing introductory studies. In this case, we did two. The book of Acts is pretty thick. Got a lot of great information. Some of the smaller books don't require so much, we, or we don't have enough information to present to you about some of the introductory studies. But in every case, it provides us with some evidence to help our faith. Where the Bible crosses history, we are historical. Where faith is necessary, we will believe, provided there is evidence to base that belief on. E.J. Carnell says, faith is the whole soul trust in God's word as true because of the sufficiency of evidence. We Christians are not in unenlightened, we're not ignoramuses, believing anything that we hear. Our beliefs are based on evidence. In part, evidence helps us establish the faith. Where we can test the Bible, we test it. And in testing it, we develop that evidence. And with that evidence, we develop faith in the places where we cannot test the Bible. Can we test the miracles that happen in the Bible? No. But we take them as truth. Because in the places where we can test, we find the truth was there. And it develops our faith. Might succeed at finishing this up, or might not. The understanding and countering of criticisms. These introductory studies help us to develop counters to people who say that the book was not written by Luke, or to say that uh, it, it was something that was written 300 years later. Uh, you know, the we statements kind of kind of do away with some of that. But the accuracy, you're not going to find that kind of accuracy with somebody who wasn't there. You're not going to find that accuracy with someone who didn't know the people, the places, the things that were happening, the historical events, because he was there. Christians need to be informed of the efforts that are against us. People trying to discredit Christianity. We need to know what's coming at us and we need to know how to defend ourselves. So these introductory or preliminary studies help us to do that. Grammatico historical method of interpretation. Introductory studies help us to understand the historical situation out of which the book came and to which it is addressed. 
By doing so, we can understand how it applies to us in our times. And as I said earlier, it's a foundation for the Restoration Movement. Restoration Movement is built upon the Book of Acts. If the Book of Acts is false, then much of the Restoration Movement is false. We must study the introductory matters to help us establish the foundation our faith rests on. One last thing. Bible translations. We probably got three different translations in our hands right here, right now. I have the NASB. I imagine there's a couple of others that have it. I'm pretty sure there's a New King James Version in here somewhere. Maybe there's a King James Version as well. And there's probably an NIV in here as well. How do we get the Bible? How do we get what we have today? We don't have the original letters, the original scrolls. None of them are, are in existence. Either they're lost or they've been destroyed. If they exist, we don't know where they're at. You know, there are some things buried in a place called Vatican City. I'd really like to get my hands on some of the stuff they've got down there. I don't know if they've got the originals down there or not. It sure would be nice to know if they'd open that place up a little bit and let people in to find out. The Catholic Church for a thousand years kept their people in the dark, meaning they kept all of us in the dark because we were all their people until some came along and decided to translate the Bible into other languages. The Gutenberg Bible. Uh, who else was it? Oh, there were a number of them. Wycliffe. Tyndale, was it? A number of translations came out. And every time one came out, they snuffed it out. And the person who came up with it. Knowledge was power. They had all the knowledge, so they had all the power. And it wasn't until Luther got somebody to back him that things finally got to change. It eventually led us to the Restoration Movement. What does that mean about translations? Yeah got off on a tangent, so let's get back to it. Over the centuries, copies were made of copies, which were made of copies, which were made of copies. Every time a copy was made, it was made from a manuscript that was not the original. So there were opportunities for an owner to maybe write some commentary in there. Uh, maybe the copiers did not know what commentary, and so they copied that as well. Maybe there were some fading of letters and they misinterpreted the letters. The Greek has a, I'm trying to remember what they call it. It's a little uh, apostrophe kind of thing that, that can change something from R to har. Gives you a little um, breathing mark or I, I forgot what they called it, but uh, so uh, sometimes when people read about Armageddon, maybe it was Armageddon, which is something different. So we have the Latin Vulgate is translated uh, roughly 400 by a guy named Jerome. And for the next thousand years, that became the Bible. And it was only available to priests. And King James comes along after King Henry VIII broke away from the Catholic Church. King James comes along and says, I want a Bible in English. And so they put one together. They called it the King James Version. And a few years later, they went back into it and they changed it around a little bit. So in 1611, they produced the current 
King James Version minus some of the revisions that we have in there. The King James Version was the version for a very long time within the English world. The King James Version was based on information. We had manuscripts between 500 and 1500. What happened to the stuff before 500? How many copies were made before that 500 date? How many mistakes do we possibly have in the King James Version because he just did not have very good manuscripts? Now, I'm saying this, but I, want you, I, I don't want to take away your, your, your faith in the King James Version. It is an excellent version. Everything you need to know about becoming a Christian, about being a Christian is in there. There is nothing different in there or nothing that can take away from that. But if you compare the newer manuscripts, the newer translations with the King James Version, you're going to find some things are different. They are going to be different. You're going to find verses missing in some of the newer translations. I can't remember which verse it was. There's a verse in Acts that's missing. I think Mark has a verse that's missing. or Mark has a whole section that's questionable. Mark 16, from verses 9 all the way through 16. Now, we have them in there, but they're in parentheses or in brackets, and it tells us not in some of the older manuscripts. We don't know. But it doesn't change anything we know about it. Why? Because we find the information elsewhere. It does not change our faith in it. That's why it was left there. Because the information is confirmed elsewhere. Shouldn't change our faith in King James. Shouldn't change our faith in some of the newer translations. So, what happened? Well, 19th century we started having some a lot of archaeological digs and a lot of finds, and all of a sudden we're starting to find some things that we didn't have before. Some older manuscript evidence. Some things that that are a little closer to the original. And usually when we look at closer to the original, we're, we're basically saying that the closer to the original we have, the more accurate, accurate it probably is. Less times it's been copied, less chances where it's, it's had uh, some fading done after copy, after copy, after copy. The less chance we have some personal commentary added in. Well, more accurate the closer we get to the original. There was one, it's hard to call this a find. A gentleman named Chester Beatty. He lived between 1875 and 1968. So his passing wasn't all that long ago. 50, 54 years. Chester Beatty was a guy who liked to acquire ancient manuscripts. Sometime around 1930, he got, a, he got a hold of some, well, between 1930 and 1940, he got a hold of some things. Things dated within the first three centuries. Things dated as far back as 85. That doesn't get much closer to the original than that. And he has parts of the Bible covering just about every book in the New Testament and a few in the Old. And it was all in Greek. There were 12 volumes published of the information that he had gotten his hands on. We don't know exactly when he got a hold of these things. We, ass we assume that he purchased them from people of maybe questionable reputation, uh, grave robbers. They had uncovered graves that had these scrolls with them. And those have helped us tremendously to try to make more accurate um, versions of the Bible in, in the last 60, 70 years. So generally speaking, the last 70 years or so, the, the translations that were created within the last 70 years are probably more accurate than those before. That said, I'm going to say, be careful. 
because there are some things out there, some, some versions out there that are not translations. They're paraphrases. Anybody think of a good paraphrase? Or a paraphrase? I can think of two right offhand. So one came out back in, I want to say in the 70s. Remember that one? Possibly the message, definitely the message. Yeah, uh, the Living Bible is the one I'm thinking of. Now the NLT, the New Living Translation, in part was was done because of the Living Bible, but it's got a lot more scholarship involved in it. The Living Bible was one gentleman trying to create a, a version of the Bible that his kids could understand. Easy to read. Yep, easy to read. Yep, and more importantly, the gentleman who wrote it was uh, premillennial and uh, once saved, always saved, Calvinistic. So he has inserted a lot of that in there. He has tried to keep the text good, but he's inserted footnotes um, that places his theology within there. So be careful when you're reading some of these. Uh, I read the message, and yeah, I'll stick with the NASB. Um, I, I'm not going to say that it's, it's not a good translation or a good paraphrase. I'll just say I'm a little bit more, um, more of a traditionalist. The NASB and the New King James are two of the better word-for-word -word translations out there. Uh, probably the best word-for-word -word translations. If you've got one of those, you, you can't go wrong. The NIV was doing fairly well until, well, the NASB, its most recent one, has neuterized the, uh, a lot of the masculine pronouns that we find in the New Testament. So be careful of that one, too. If the original writer said, use pronouns that were he or she, uh, we've got no right to make it he or she. It's either he or it's she. And we need to leave it that way. The message also used different names for things. And I didn't care for that. If the original or the, the more correct translations, the Greek has, it, has the, the proper name for something, he should have left it the same way. And I tried to change it. Uh, and when I say that, he's, he's translating it. That's what he's doing. He'll take a Greek name and translate it to uh, something English rather than transliterate it. Two types of translations, concordant translations, translates every word in the same order from Greek to English, and then formal equivalent, which translates the verb in Greek to the verb in English, the noun in Greek to the noun in English, that, that way. The formal equivalent is probably the better translations to use, and I would say most of us, I think, are using those. Um, I like to do little advertisements for library ads for people. If you want to add to your personal library, I'll pass this around. It's the Johnson's New People Testament. It's got some explanatory notes. One of the things that it was designed to do was um, get people to ask the question, what translation do you use? Pass it around. What's that? It says volume one. Yeah, there's two volumes, or you can get both in one. You can get one thick volume, or you can get two single volumes. I got the two single volumes because I don't like handling those fat books. My commentary on Acts from my professor, uh, about that thick. And his Romans commentary is even bigger. Oh, is it bigger? And yes, I've read all the way through both of them. And we've covered introductory studies. Okay, we got five minutes left. Questions, comments?